Hey troops, what's going on? My name's Ryan. I'm a former Royal Marines commando from the United Kingdom. Today we're going to be reacting to US enemies are not going to like this video. I haven't watched this video. Apparently it's going to be a good one. It's been recommended to me a few times. So let's just get straight into this one. Guys, before we do, smash that like button, subscribe and share far and wide. Drop a comment for the algorithm and I'll see you in the comments troops. Let's go. Chart. It compares military budgets of countries, but it's a bit different, because it doesn't compare one country's military spending to another, but instead compares the US's military spending with the cumulative total of the nine other countries' military spending. We're all on the top 10 list of... Okay, so this is, it's unfair in the sense that there's like nine other countries involved, but we look at the sheer size of the United States, the amount they have spending. It has to be done this way, otherwise the United States landslides other countries, clearly. This wouldn't even be a video, guys. Biggest spenders. The reason? Well, the United States spent over $800 billion on its military in 2021. That's that we know of, all right? We've got like the Black Fund or whatever you call it. Is it the Black Fund or there's... um. There's that money for, like, special operations that they don't really have to declare, I think. Anyone help me out what that is? I think... Black Fund? Why am I thinking the Black Fund? One. Those outspending South Korea, Japan, Saudi Arabia, Germany, France, Russia, the UK, India, and China combined. So, Insane. there's frankly no worthwhile comparison to be made here. Yet still, after fighting wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and after a trade war with China, as well as unfriendly relations with Iran and North Korea, the US has its fair share of of enemies who undoubtedly want to hurt them in one way, shape, or form. So, hypothetically speaking, despite such a well-equipped military, could an enemy ever successfully invade the US or make devastating damages to the nation in some way? Well, as it turns out, this question was a bit harder to answer than I initially planned, because the military is only one of the reasons why the US is so unconquerable. You see, the US is an yeah, I'm guessing he's going to talk about geography and stuff like that. If you were to launch a full-scale invasion on the United States, you would have to deploy, you know, massive amounts of equipment and, um, and infrastructure across, like, wide-open seas, and then you'd still not be able to get ashore. You know, you've got the Navy to contend with. This is really tough in terms of uh, uh, being able to accomplish, guys, okay? An incredible position, geographically. And its secret weapon might therefore be its location. I have to agree wholeheartedly. All you have to do is look at this map to understand why. For over 150 years, America's territory has stretched all the way across the continent from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. These huge coasts separate the US from any potential enemy. So even in wartime, the American mainland is very well protected. There's some would argue that Russia has the ability to attack from like that northern flank into Canada and stuff. But let's be honest, guys, if you were managing and able to get through that border and survive the harsh weather that's there anyway, you're you, d you deserve to invade. OK, you're doing a good job, but it's just not happening. That's not a viable optional um, option for them to do. It's just the survivability factor. Right? It's really, really difficult. Take World War Two, for example, when America fought in both Europe and Asia at the same time. Barely any attacks happened on US soil during the entire war. That meant American factories could keep making planes and weapons without interruptions, unlike the constantly bombed Soviet and British factories. Yeah, it hammered us. You know, you, you just look back in history. The, never mind the Soviet factories, Britain, all right? We were knackered without the United States supporting us. We got absolutely blitzed. That's what they call it, the blitz. On top of that, the Defense Production Act allowed the president to allocate materials and facilities for national defense, direct companies to prioritize government orders, and offer loans to companies to make this happen fast. In 2020, this law was used to increase the production of ventilators and medical grade masks. So clearly, it's a very useful law to have in the toolbox since the US still has a domestic industrial base with major shipyards, aviation, and automotive factories. A wartime scenario could easily involve switching to wartime production, so this makes sense. Not to mention the existing military industry which is already making tanks, planes, weapons, and warships for the US military. I was in the 29 Palms um, in the Mojave Desert when I was training with the US Marine Corps 2013 or 14 and their base, 
that base was like bigger than the um, than the direct area of London. There's an area we call the M25. It's a road system that surrounds pretty much the whole of London and its surrounding boroughs. It's pretty big, okay? Now, that area, I believe, 29 Palms, was was bigger than that whole area. And we're talking about a military base bigger than the an entire district of, in the United Kingdom. All right? <laughs> the, the United States do things bigger and better in so many different areas. It just can't be disputed, guys, okay? When it comes to the military, the second to none. Factories on US soil are a huge advantage because the US military can protect its supply chain simply by defending its own territory. Very little has to come from outside compared to its enemies, who would need to constantly run supplies across an entire ocean. I mean, just look at the size of the Atlantic Ocean and the even bigger. There, that map actually annotates quite well what I was talking about, Troop. So what I was talking about before in terms of an area that they could potentially attack from was, was here. Obviously, this is American territory as well, US territory, but the environment here is just so terribly harsh. You have no idea, guys. It wouldn't be a viable means to be able to get across. And also, if we look at the area in general, they would still have to utilize a lot of their naval um, equipment, boats, ships, and all of that to be able to get the equipment onto the land base there. But the land base would be just extremely hard to operate on and then you've got to think these guys once they manage to do that if they manage to do that they've got to be able to get to the area in which they want to do and they're obviously upsetting um another country canada as well so it's just not a viable way of attack all right it's a massive massive area it doesn't make any logistical sense to do that troops okay uh just wanted to annotate that for you guys Pacific to get an idea of just how long enemy supply chains would have to be. Not to mention the fact that with today's satellites, it would be trivially easy to spot an invasion coming from thousands of miles away and take out enemy shipments before they ever reach the US coast. Supply lines are critical in any war and the Supply lines are the overriding factor in any war as to why a military would fail, okay? If you can't supply the troops on the front lines, if you can't supply troops to the front lines with their kit and equipment and be able to sustain them for a period of time, then you might as well not have invaded in the first place. This is one of the problems we're seeing with the Russia-Ukraine war at this moment in time. It's that sustainability that just isn't there when you look at Russia, all right? They've never really been great with logistics and logistics and supply chains they tie in with one another okay there's no point having a good logistical um a logistical chain if you haven't got the supplies to be able to be pushed through that logistical chain okay you've just got to have the kit and equipment and the means to get that kit and equipment to where it needs to be america has this on multiple fronts they can fight on multiple fronts on major offenses um around the globe at different times okay that's how good their logistical supply chain actually is the US military is well known for its excellent logistics capabilities. They have the added advantage of the 45,000 mile highway system, which was designed with troop movements in mind. On top of that, the US has 140,000 miles of freight railway infrastructure. Now sure, this can be a double-edged sword, as enemies could use this infrastructure to penetrate into America's heartland. Nah. Uh, I see where they're coming from, but you'd have to get into the heartland in the first place. You'd have to be there, present, to be able to attack that infrastructure. There's no point trying to attack that strategically from sea, all right? It just wouldn't happen, so I, I disagree with that, actually. An infrastructure could definitely be a weak point, if not probably guarded. A good example of this would be this pipeline that runs over 5,500 miles from Texas to New Jersey and carries nearly 45% of the East Coast's fuel supply. In May 2021, a cyber attack shut down the pipeline for five days. And this isn't a fluke either. China and Russia both support cybercrime groups that regularly attack government agencies and companies. The former head lawyer for the NSA, Stuart Baker, told the Washington Post, quote, we're fighting the cyber equivalent of a land war in Asia every day. But America's infrastructure is more than just highways and internet cables. Back in the day, another kind of highway already connected the Midwest from north to south the Mississippi River, and the connected Missouri River is the fourth longest river system in the world. So yeah. 
Didn't know that, guys. This river has always been crucial to connecting the economies of major cities like New Orleans, Minneapolis, and St. Louis. Today, the river is still used to ship goods across America. So during an invasion, the Mississippi could likely help move troops and weapons too. What's impressive about the US's geography is how challenging it makes the US to conquer. And that might have to do with the diversity of terrains like deserts, swamps, and mountains. 100% when you think about the diversity of the weather systems that are there just by the environment in which you are in, you can be in the same continent and experience, you know, <laughs> extreme, extreme environments. And um, yeah, when I was in, uh, again, the Mojave Desert, really, really hot. It took me by surprise just how hot and dry and desolate that area was to train. I'll go as far as saying it was probably the hottest place I've ever been. Um, I've been to many places in the Middle East and Mojave sticks out as being one of the one of the hardest, hottest environments I've ever been in. And then I've been in the other areas and my friends have been deployed in other areas in the United States, training alongside our brothers and counterparts. And it's been pretty much tropical, all right? Rainfall, tropical, still hot, humid. You name it, guys. America's got it all. That's going to be very hard to equip correctly equip individuals to be able to fight on multiple fronts in the same country, that's for sure. The Appalachian Mountains in the east and the Rocky Mountains in the west serve as major barriers to inland invasion and the Great Lakes in the northeast form yet another barrier. The 100%. result is that the flatter areas along the southern border seem like the best entry point. But the US compensates for these weaknesses with huge numbers of troops stationed in California and Texas. The coasts aren't any easier to invade with hundreds of thousands of troops stationed in military bases. Not to mention the fact that the US has peaceful relations with its neighbors to the north and south, which both have smaller populations and militaries if any turmoil was to unfold. I think if they needed to, if the if America was invaded, I definitely think that relation with Canada and Mexico would strong would be stronger, and I think they'd um, be doing anything in their powers to protect each other from this. Let me know, guys. I know the American spirit does kind of drift off into Canada and Mexico a little bit, but I might be off with that. What's your thoughts on the ground? If you're American, let me know, troops. To the east and west, the U.S. has no neighbors, as previously discussed. A fact which has led America to focus on other things instead of imminent invasions. On top of that, the NATO treaty requires European and Canadian allies to come to America's defense if it's ever attacked. Oh yeah, and in addition to its current military personnel, the US still maintains the selective service system. See, all may Don't know what that is. Selective service system. Males from 18 to 25 have to sign up for- No, right, okay, so it's an equivalent of like a conscription. Right, but not as stringent, I think. A lottery to be drafted in the case of a national emergency. During the height of World War II, the US drafted over 3 million men per year. So this system could potentially expand the US's military personnel by several million. And we're not even done yet, because besides all this, an invasion is still very unlikely for another reason. The Pentagon's... Honestly, guys, I know I'm kind of defeating the object just saying this all the time, but I just don't see any plausible reason why anyone, even if they could get close, would actually invade. It doesn't make any logical sense. I, I don't ever see this happening, honestly. The only, I just don't ever see this happen unless the Transformers came from outer space. Um, I just don't see it happening, guys. Unrivaled resources. As I mentioned in the beginning, the US's defense budget is unrivaled. The US spent almost three times as much as China in 2021 and 10 times more than Russia. The result is that no country has enough ships or planes to get past the US forces. According to one military expert, quote, the amphibious assault capability of the combined militaries of the world are simply too insignificant to get a beachhead on a coast. And then we of course have the civilians, who have even more guns than the military. So maybe- <laughs> Let's talk about this. This is a touchy subject, I know little on, but what I do know is, you Americans know how to fire weapon systems, a lot of you guys are well acquainted with multiple different weapon systems, your homes are um, mostly protected with these weapon systems. It's something that I think is an absolute right to have. And um, you guys are proud of those weapons, okay? It gives you the ability to um, fight against 
tyranny effectively and I'm all for that you know Britain hasn't got that in its culture at this moment maybe it's a little change in the future I don't know but I think it's right for America personally and if you're in vain forget about the military you've got to worry about the estimate number of firearms per 100 residents as per this graph US has 120.5 <laughs> the closest country is Yemen with 52.8 guys it's <laughs> so if you're not messing with the military you're messing with the civilians who at this moment in time seem to be worse <laughs> or more armed than the military. The armed citizens could also join the fight against invaders. I mean, it's a possibility. But anyway, urban warfare presents more challenges than fighting in open combat and often gives an advantage to the country defending its own territory. 100%. We only have to look at Russia's failed invasion of Kiev for proof of this factor. Yeah, I agree with that. While urban areas make up a small amount of US territory, any invader would have to take control of cities to conquer the country, since 82% of the population lives in these cities. Another advantage of armies defending their own country from invasion is the will to fight. According to the RAND Corporation, a think tank closely tied to the Pentagon, will to fight means the disposition and decision to fight to keep fighting and to win. America from the guys that I've worked with, the guys and girls, um, just from speaking to a regular civilian all the way up to, you know, a fully-fledged reek on Marine Special Forces, there's one thing that they have common, and that's that will to fight, okay? The report highlights the Times' will to fight was emphasized in US military doctrine, demonstrating just how vital it is to military victories. You can clearly see how that influenced the outcome of World War II and the Vietnam War. When a country is invaded like Vietnam was, it's natural that the invaded country is more motivated to defend its land. I think it's safe to assume the same would apply during an invasion of the US. But 100%. let's shift gears for a bit and discuss one enormous US advantage I haven't mentioned which is self-reliance for its food, energy, and weapons needs. Take these green areas, for example. This land is mostly used for agriculture since only 2% of America's land is in urban areas. This low-lying land is a major reason why the US is nearly self-sufficient in agriculture and even exports food to many countries around the world. It also explains why America now actually has the most arable land in the world. That's right, the US has more arable land than India and China. What's more surprising is that is surprising. I never thought about that. So when we're talking about sustainability, they've got it in abundance. That India is only a third the size of the US, and China is slightly smaller but can only sustain large populations near its east coast. The crazy thing is that both of those countries have over 1.3 billion people, or about 1 billion more than the US population. And since the US is only projected to grow by another 100 million people over the next century, the US likely has enough resources to support a billion plus population, but they don't need to. As for energy, the US also has impressive amounts of petroleum and gas, especially in parts of Texas. It has around 44 billion barrels of proved crude oil reserves and almost 500 trillion cubic feet of natural gas reserves. Yeah, that's not going anywhere anytime soon. So what that is saying to me is they've got the ability to um, logistically speaking with the military, sustain their ground forces for a long period of time um, without having to rely on other countries to be able to support them with oil. All right? Things don't work without oil and they've got it in abundance to be able to support themselves. That's massive, guys, when we're talking about war. In fact, when you include biofuels, the US could be considered the largest oil producer in the world. It's Isn't it? I thought it was like Qatar or Saudi, the Middle Eastern countries. Someone let me know. It seems like even the bad parts of US geography have a major silver lining. The Appalachian Mountains on the east coast that I mentioned earlier aren't suited for farming, but they do have huge coal deposits that have been exploited for decades. And surprisingly, at least to me, America has the world's largest coal reserves and loads of other natural resources from energy to metals. But to share a bit of a weakness of the US, it turns out it doesn't have every metal it needs to defend itself. You see, this shiny looking rock is a mineral called antimony and is critical for making bullets and other weapons, and even night vision goggles. Well 
Never heard of it before, if I'm honest with you. While antimony played an important role in World War II ammunition production, the last mine in the US closed in 1997. The US is therefore reliant on China and Russia, its two biggest military rivals for supply of this critical mineral. So the US does have weaknesses, but who could actually have the military might and, most importantly, motivation to try and invade the US? Well, the latest US defense strategy names the People's Republic of China China as the US's most consequential strategic competitor. And note that Russia poses acute threats. Yeah, Russia, China, India, who is on that list as well. I didn't realize um, in terms of that nuclear list I'm on about, actually, um, slightly different to this in terms of the most threatening. But it's uh, Russia and China, obviously, their relations with each other, that's going to cause problems, isn't it? Beyond these two big threats, it also mentions North Korea and Iran. But let's focus on China for a bit. It's true that China is slowly building up its military capabilities, but it isn't even ready to launch an invasion on the island of Taiwan, let alone the west coast of the United States. I don't think I even need to mention how the loss of its largest trading partner would devastate state the Chinese economy. Still, mm. there's some reason for concern. If China disabled American satellites, it could debilitate the US military's ability to monitor troop movements in real time. If you're thinking this sounds like science fiction though... Hang on, did he just say sunlight? He did, didn't he? Um... Right, okay. You'd be wrong, because in 2007, China successfully destroyed one of its own satellites with a ballistic missile, floating 800 and... Ah, satellite. I thought you said sunlight. I was going to say. 50 kilometers above the Earth, the destroyed satellite is at a similar altitude to US intelligence satellites. So China could theoretically destroy them too. In terms of Russia, well, they have now performed a similar test, which endangered the crew of the ISS. Taking out satellites is a bit extreme though, because it causes hazardous space debris that would affect all current and future satellites, that includes Russia's and China's satellites. But Russia and China are already interfering with US satellites on a daily basis. They're just using lasers and jammers instead of trying to shoot them down. Yeah, I guess one way to get at the infrastructure of a country and nothing works if we're all reliant on that infrastructure is tattling the satellites. That does make a lot of sense. It would be something that I can see becoming a bit of an arms race over the next few years. Um, one, to improve um, the defense of space and uh, the things within that space, i.e. satellites. Um, we've already seen that with America, creating the Space Force. Okay, it sounds stupid, but, you know, in the future, we might actually be heavily reliant on that. Okay, especially with all the satellite and infrastructure up there that we rely on more and more each day, okay? What is even scarier, though, is China's recent investments in AI and quantum computing. This is the scariest thing known to man, I think. Which could change the future of warfare. I mean, imagine how hard it would be for the Pentagon to strategize against an enemy using an AI supercomputer to calculate decisions in milliseconds. But if we look at Russia again for a second, their military has turned out to be much more disorganized and incompetent than we imagined before their invasion of Ukraine in early 2022. Still, they're definitely a force to be reckoned with, with nearly a million troops, thousands of vehicles and specialized hacker units. Yeah, it's not to be underestimated, that's for sure, guys, okay? We can never underestimate the capability of any country, um, especially with um, what's going on in the world right now. As for other potential attackers, North Korea, for example, may boast that their nuclear weapons can reach the US mainland, but owing to their low budgets and antique equipment, there's no way they could invade the entire US. Iran is a similar story, except that they don't yet have a nuclear warhead, although they're not far off. Realistically speaking, both countries countries use nukes to preserve the regime rather than actually use them against their enemies. Cuba and Venezuela are two other enemy nations in the US's backyard, but their troop numbers and military budgets are hardly enough to invade the United States. And if all else fails to stop an invasion, we shouldn't forget that America is a nuclear armed nation itself. It has there we go, there's the Space Force there. As a triad of air- Shouldn't he be wearing like something else other than camouflage military attire? You should be wearing like a Darth Vader uniform, shouldn't you? 
air, <laughs> land and sea missiles, which make it impossible to take out entirely. Land missiles are stored in the center of the country, and the sea missiles are in submarines, which are constantly on the move, hidden away without a blip on the radar. Since the Cold War though, nuclear weapons have acted more as a deterrent rather than a direct threat. You see, the principle of mutually assured destruction essentially means anyone who uses a nuke will get nuked back, launching a chain reaction of nuclear warfare, eventually obliterating Earth and ending humanity. But just for fun, let's compare nuclear arsenals. I've said this once, I'll say it again. I don't think in my lifetime we'll see um, nuclear warheads being utilised. I just don't see it. I think they're far too dangerous. I think the whole world knows that they're far too dangerous. I just don't see it happening. I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me in the comments. I don't care. That's just how I think. All right. So the US and Russia currently have around 5,000 nukes with around 1,500 deployed at heavy bomber bases and on intercontinental missiles. And then we of course have China. It has a couple hundred nuclear weapons, but none of them are deployed. Now, these numbers might seem high since they can literally eradicate humanity, but this is actually a low point from the peak of 70,000 nukes worldwide in the mid-1980s. What's still quite worrying though is that while the US claims to have decommissioned over 11,000 nuclear warheads since 1994, China and Russia are thought to be increasing their stockpile. But despite this, I hope you can see how costly it would be to even attempt Something like that is just devastating on an unbelievable we can't even imagine, guys. Nuclear war just isn't going to happen. I just don't think it's going to happen ever. An invasion of the US. Any hypothetical invasion would have to overcome the US's huge military and geographical advantages to gain any ground. While it is plausible that a major state actor like China or Russia could take out satellites and hack critical infrastructure, they'd also have to contend with the millions of well-equipped troops on the ground and a hostile armed population. So realistically, a physical invasion isn't really a possibility it's not a possibility we can we can answer that now what do you guys think in the comments is it a possibility I'm going to go with no. But what if America's enemies could get what they wanted without an invasion? Well, it turns out it's much easier to conquer hearts and minds in an information war than to win with soldiers on the ground. True. And that might have something to do with Russia's influence campaign in the 2016 US presidential elections. See, after a three-year investigation, a bipartisan US Senate committee recently concluded that Russia conducted an influence campaign to help Donald Trump get elected. If that's not shocking enough, the report states that Vladimir Putin himself ordered the hacking of Democratic Party emails to be leaked over WikiLeaks. The FBI now wow. has a warrant out for 12 Russian military intelligence officers it believes interfered in the 2016 elections. So this is a serious incident. Yeah, there's going to be a few guys in trouble, that's for sure, especially when America's uh, found out who the guys are. A recent report by a group of intelligence agencies claims Russia tried to interfere again in 2020, though on a smaller scale. Whether Russia continues to meddle in US politics in the future or not, the damage may already be done as Americans increasingly report a loss of faith in democracy and government institutions. But that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. I just realized I didn't have the video on for a few seconds there, guys. US enemies are not going to like this video. Um, true, that last bit got me there, the information war in America. It's um, more prevalent than I think we'd believe. And it is affecting, you know, society as a whole. But I think the spirit of Americans will always um, seep through whatever crap they're going through, so to speak. But uh, fantastic video, guys. I'll be interested to see what the comments are like on this one. And uh, I'll see you in the comments, guys. If you want to support me a little bit more, then please consider joining the Patreon. I really couldn't make these videos every day without you guys. So I thank every one of you Patrons out there. Link will be in the description, troops. But wherever you are, have a fantastic day. And I'll see you next time. Peace.